God bless you, brother. It is beyond wonderful to be with you today. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 6, and uh, we're going to focus our thoughts out of that. Uh, second uh, observation is that there was not a clock there when I was pastor. <laughs> <clears throat> and it says uh, 20 of. Does that really mean it is something else? Oh. Oh. My dad one time uh, uh, preached revival over in uh, Mars Hill where I pastored after here, looked at the clock, and he said, don't y'all realize, Charles doesn't use a clock. He uses a calendar. And so, um, and I think I've mentioned in the past that uh, in the early days, uh, and this will be some material shared later uh, with you when the pastors, when this church began, uh, the preachers would normally preach for a minimum of an hour. And a preacher was not considered long-winded until he went beyond two hours. Can I get a witness? Amen? <laughs> and so uh, uh, things are, are uh, uh, so different today than it has been, but there is a common thread uh, that is woven through uh, the, uh, the annals of time. And as a, a, a church, it is Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no other foundation that can be laid other than him. Uh, real briefly, I'm going to uh, put a parenthesis uh, in here. Uh, Marsha, again, believe me, we had the conversation again this morning, really desired to be here, and, uh, and was doing well through Thursday, and then has had a little setback, and she is uh, uh, home uh, and has an appointment tomorrow, but we'll see what's going on. Keep us in your prayers. Our oldest daughter, Sarah, and her husband, and our two beautiful grandbabies, uh, live in, of all places, Las Vegas, Nevada. And you ask, how does the preacher start to get there? She married a lawyer. Um, enough said. But they're active uh, in a fellowship out there. Uh, our son, C.A., and his wife have been married about four years. This past year moved to Denver, Colorado to be a part of a new church start. Seven couples from their church in the Memphis area moved out there. And uh, he is with an insurance uh, all-state firm out there. And uh, they're doing well. Our youngest daughter, Mara, uh, is living in Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, pretty serious with the young man. And uh, when she brought him home, we thought this is pretty serious. And, uh, but uh, she's an interior designer with a firm up there, and uh, all our kids are, are doing well. Some of you remember my dad, uh, who, Lord willing, will be 95 uh, come April. He's still mentally in good shape, physically has slowed down quite a bit, but he preached here on a number of occasions. And he is practicing, in a sense, what he preached. Uh, in that, uh, one of those occasions was the Senior Adult Sunday, which used to be, I think, the first Sunday of May. And he got up here and he said, do you want to know the secret of living a long life? And he paused and everybody waited. He said, keep breathing. So I recommend that to you, as uh, my father has before, uh, that you keep breathing. Um, I have been immersed uh, with helping you through this process of your bicentennial. And uh, I have been immersed in uh, many things Flat Creek, reading through the minutes of the church uh, history, reading through associational minutes, reading through newspapers and other things to be able to uh, flesh out and put together some things to help you better understand what God has done uh, in this midst of this fellowship. And uh, the first poster, wherever it is, that we produced uh, last month, and you'll be getting one of those every month. Uh, uh, if you haven't taken a look at that, not because I made it, take a look at it. Because this is a unique fellowship. As the praise team was sitting here singing, uh, Lord Almighty, the great I am, and I have been so immersed in uh, this church and where it has been, uh, for me here a few moments ago, is transformative to think about all the folks through the last 200 years who have gathered in this spot that is sacred, and it is sacred for the sake, not for the sake of those who are buried out here, but it is sacred for the, the, the things that God has done in the presence of this fellowship, in the midst of his people, and the lives that have been transformed as a part of this fellowship. And as I was sitting here today, I thought about those early worship services. You are the only church in North Georgia that I, as a Baptist historian, can confirm, uh, based on tangible evidence, 
that there was a gathering of three races under one small roof to worship. The Cherokee Indian uh, tombstones out here uh, would indicate if they're buried here that they worshiped here. Now, for many of you, our first 30 minutes, and excuse me if I say our, I feel like I'm still yours and you are mine. As I looked at our early minutes, um, the first 30 years are missing. But the fact that the tombstones are here that have the Cherokee script, this, I know of churches that no longer exist, that were Indian churches, that were mission churches, that dissolved, or in one case, actually the oldest church technically in North Georgia, north of the Chattahoochee, you know where that church exists today? It's in Arkansas. It was a part of the Chattahoochee Association. And the pastor was, I told uh, Jojo the other day, the first moderator of the Chattahoochee Baptist Association. He was a missionary pastor. And when the church moved to Arkansas, he moved with them. Duncan O'Brien was his name. And when I think about the fact that here in this place, this church still stands as a beacon of the fact that in Christ there is no east or west, in him no north or south, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. To think in that small, tiny gathering in those early years that there would have been uh, uh, whites, African Americans, and Indians gathered together singing praises to the great I Am. Wow. What a heritage that you have. It is something, though, that is not just your heritage. It's it's really God's heritage. It is what God has done in this place. And a part of what God has done in this place has dealt with, actually, the fellowship of this body. And how, through the years, the fellowship of this body has loved and nurtured each other with the ultimate goal of bringing out the best in their brothers and sisters in Christ who were a part of this fellowship. Today, I want us to look at Galatians chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse 1, where we see the scripture says, Brethren, Even if a man is caught up in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one of you, looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one shall bear his own load. As a part of the fellowship of Christ, as a part part of the, the body of believers that are here, our fellowship, historically speaking, as a part of the body of Christ here, has involved taking care of the spiritual well-being of everybody in the flock. This has been a responsibility that just hasn't been the charge of the many pastors who have been here, but it has always been a charge of the church to maintain its fellowship with one another and to keep the peace. In fact, in the rules of decorum, uh, and the rules of decorum are a list of items that every time the church gathered together for their time of business, that the church adopted and they made sure every time they would go through this order of rules. It's called the rules of decorum. For most of the early church history, the third thing that happened after they called together, had prayer and other things, was they called for the peace of the fellowship. And, uh, well, actually they called for the fellowship, and you hope that it said, and found peace. It didn't always say that they found peace. But if they didn't find peace, it meant that there was a problem within the fellowship that the body needed to take care of. 
Now, this uh, uh, problem basically would involve an intervention on the part of the church. When you joined the church, you were asking the church to help you to grow in Christ. Inherent with that was this. If the church saw you get out of line, you understood that the church would call you to account. And so when somebody did not uh, 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 live in a way that was honoring God, when the church came and the church gathered in this place once a month for church conference, and by the way, if you didn't show to conference, you had to have an excuse or they could come kick you out of the church. That's what it amounted to. And so these people would come and they would have these issues that they were dealing with. And the church would say, now brother so-and-so, now sister so-and-so, here's the issue. You know what the issue is. And we want to call you to an account. We want to ask you uh, uh, to repent in order that you might be able to be restored to the fellowship. When they were doing this and they were assigning people to walk with these people who were struggling with different aspects of sin in their life, open sin, then the church would, as the scripture here says, would bear with them. It says, brethren, if, you, if even a man is caught in any transgress, you are spiritual, restore such one in spirit of gentleness, each one uh, looking to yourself, lest you be tempted, and bear one another's burdens. The expression, bear one another's burdens, is the same expression that is found in the church minutes when it said that the church dealt with so-and-so who is struggling with an issue in their life, and the church would bear with them or the person who is under the watchful eye of the church dealing with this struggle in their life, they would ask the church to bear with them. Now, what was the purpose of this? Uh, the purpose of this was to not only help them grow in, in Christ, it was also to maintain the integrity of the fellowship. Why? Because if somebody was not living in a way that honored God, it was something that uh, was a taint on this fellowship. Can you believe that? People over Flat Creek are letting those people live like that? That church, if they were doing something right, would call them back into account. Now, we don't think like that today. But that's how they thought. And as I would go through and read these minutes, I'm thinking, who in the world would want to join a church like that? Man, they're kicking them out right and left. They're calling them up before the church on all kinds of things. Who in the world would want to join a church like that? Well, you know something? This, this wasn't the only church behaving that way. This was the way that the larger church did church in this era. So that if you got out of line, uh, 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 you were called into account. If you joined the other church first, if you were under... Uh, suspicions or the church was bearing with you at that time or you had been kicked out of the church, excommunicated so to speak, if you went to join another church and they called for your letter, guess what the church would do? They would write them back and say, they are not in good standing. You don't want them. And the church would not take them into membership until they came back to Flat Creek, asked to be restored, asked for forgiveness. Flat Creek would say, we do this, we see that God's dealing in your life, that you've dealt with these issues, we grant you your letter, and then they could join another church. It was something that was, if you want to get down to it, it was everybody's business. And so because of that, we see that the fellowship was a very tight-knit fellowship. It was a fellowship that also was looking out for each other's needs. But the, also, the most important reason that they did this wasn't to punish people. The most important reason they did this was to restore them. The goal was never to punish somebody. The goal was never to kick them out just for the sake of kicking them out. Uh, the goal wasn't to bring them before the church and make charges. And I mean, they didn't have soap operas that, those days, but you go to church, a lot of times it basically was a soap opera. 
But their goal was, verse 1, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness. Each one looking to yourself, lest you to be tempted. It was to be done in a spirit of gentleness. It was to be done in a spirit of love. It was to be done in a spirit of redemption. So when these folks were brought before the church for various uh, and sundry things, they were uh, hoping to not only restore them, but to realize that they themselves may be tempted by the very same thing. Now, I know several years ago, when uh, I was uh, asked to speak, uh, I told you about uh, Makaija, uh, the gentleman that holds a record for being kicked out of this church more than anybody else. As I recall, and I, as I've been reading through your minutes again, I haven't kept the running tally, I should have, but as I recall, 17 times. I'm not going to tell you his last name because last time some of his family uh, got on me. But I will tell you this, it was not Propes, it was not Millwood, and it was not Couch. <laughs> my, my. But Makaija eventually moved over to Rome, Georgia area. In fact, well, I'm about to give the last name away, so I need to stop that story. Moved over there. But when he died, where did he want to be buried? Right back here at this church that turned him out but kept on taking him in because they loved him enough to know that he could do better. And they held him to account. You see, that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have for each other. In fact, the Bible tells us uh, that we are to bear with each other and fulfill the law of Christ as we bear one another's burdens. Now, what is the law of Christ? Compare what this concept of the law of Christ with the Old Testament law of whom? Moses. The Old Testament law of Moses was, as the New Testament tells us, sort of a school teacher or a tutor, basically to help us to see that man on his own will never be good enough to get to heaven. And it paved the way for us to understand that there was no sacrifice that we could make down here that would ultimately pay the debt that we owe before God. And it opened up our understanding and concept in those that there would be a Messiah who would be the perfect sacrifice. The law of Christ is a law where Jesus said that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And he told us that no uh, greater love has any man than to lay down his life in sacrifice for those that he loves. When Jesus said, you are to love each other as I have loved you, how did Jesus love us? Jesus loved us, uh, not with a casual love, not with a heart, half-hearted love, but Jesus loved us with a love that compelled him not to run, even though he prayed, Father, if it be my will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. It was a love that took him back to Jerusalem where he knew that he was going to be offered up, where he knew he was going to be betrayed, where he knew he was going to be crucified, and where he also understood that he had to die for our sins. But praise God, where there was also an empty tomb waiting to validate that everything he said and preached and did was true. We need to have that kind of love for each other in the fellowship. And through the years, this fellowship has uh, ex uh, expressed and shown that kind of love for each other through the years, through those difficult days. And that love has resulted in the fellowship also taking care of each other. Now, when we think of fellowship, often we, we think of uh, dinner on the grounds. Now, Gary, the best I can tell from the records I can find, 
We started observing uh, a memorial service originally around 1900 on the third Sunday of May. It may have gone back before that, but that is where I can actually trace it and document it. So for uh, over 100 years, on the third Sunday of May, you know, there'd be a great spread, and we think of that as fellowship. My son would love to be here. And I'm waiting for, uh, uh, see the expression on some of y'all's faces. When I make the next, say the next words I'm about to say. Lake Louise. My son, Robbie Smith, Tyler Reed, Drew, all these kids, they lived for Lake Louise. All they talked about for a whole year was next year at Lake Louise or last year at Lake Louise. We'd go up there, those water balloon fights were epic. We had the haunted cabin and everything. I was preaching, went up late on a Sunday night when we were staying over extra days. We got there about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I said, C.A., let's not wake up everybody. And he was more asleep than awake. So let's just go to this cabin over here. We went to that cabin over there. A couple of hours later, he woke up and realized we were in the haunted cabin. <laughs> we went outside and slept in the car the rest of the night. Everybody gave him to breakfast the next morning. There we were in the car. Those times when we have laughed together, we have shared together, that is fellowship. But fellowship is also those times when we have wept together, when we have cried together. When we've gone places that, in a sense, we wish we didn't have to go. But when we had to go there, we didn't go alone. Now, my first year here, I did more funerals than Bob Kane did the whole time he was here before me. Now, that really bonded me as a pastor with the church until the rumors got out that my preaching was killing him. But how many times have we gathered here to say goodbye to somebody that we dearly, 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 dearly loved? A saint who had gone on, and the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be... Yeah. So many of those precious moments, but you know, when we, we got here, we were not alone. And guess where we learned that love? Not only from the love that Christ had for us, but that love that was demonstrated in and through those who had also found Christ as their Savior, who are part of this body, who loved us through those tough times. You see, fellowship is more than just those good times. It is helping to go through the bad times. It is also helping to call out the best in each other and to bear one another's burdens with one another in order that God can be glorified in us and in this place. There are so many examples, and I jotted a few down, and, and I'm not as tech savvy as some folks. They're on my phone here. But to look at some of these things, the fellowship where folks bared one another's burdens in the history of this church. Uh, there were the uh, Underground Railroad. Wrote about that on that poster. Two couples were, were actually called out because they were harboring black couples, African Americans, because they were harboring slaves, runaways. But you know what the church did the next month? They restored them to fellowship. There was a period in this church where alcohol 
was wrecking havoc. It's interesting when you read contemporary history outside what was going on in the 1880s and 1890s in early 20th century. It was the time that the temperance movement started and the reason the temperance movement started was because alcohol was the opioid crisis of that day and age. And probably the most common thing for folks from this church to have people be brought before the church was the fact that alcohol was consuming them. One man came and said, listen, I got drunk. Will you please bear with me? He didn't wait for the church to come to him. He went to the church. And it was something that was tearing the fellowship apart. If you ever watch Ken Burns' series on uh, Prohibition, his uh, secular historian Ken Burns said, this thing was terrible. That's why everybody in the nation voted in Prohibition was because it was destroying America. And time after time, there were those who would come, and at one point, they had to actually establish this church a fellowship committee. And the fellowship committee, which is what it was called, had nothing to do with homecoming, had nothing to do with dinner on the grounds. It was all about dealing with the issues, primarily alcoholism, within the membership of this church. At one point in 1893, it got so bad, and the church was dealing with so many people over this issue that they basically, and I've never seen this in any other place, granted a general amnesty and uh, absolution to everybody if they were willing to repent. They had so many people that were being destroyed by this. Never seen that any other place. We know that there uh, was uh, a a manslaughter case. One of the members uh, got in a fight with his father-in-law. Why did he get in his fight with his father-in-law? His father-in-law was drunk. He came home. His father-in-law was actually abusing his daughter, this man's wife. He got into a fight to try to break it up and to deal with it, and the father-in-law was killed in that fight. It was not considered murder. It was considered manslaughter. But it was something that this church had to deal with. I can't tell you how many ladies in the church were called out, and it was always within one or two exceptions, ladies that were called out for being pregnant, uh, of course, ladies for that, but, but having relations outside of marriage. Man, this was tough. But the church was willing to deal with it in an open and a loving way. It was obvious to everybody in the community. But the church said, you've got a problem, and we love you, and we want you to be able to do better, and we want to work with you and help you to grow in Christ. Heresy on a number of occasions. Then there was disease, young mothers, Let me ask, any of y'all ever heard, and I may not be pronouncing it right, but I think I am, of a disease called pellagra? Okay, there's, I think, two of you. Raise your hands high. Okay. All right, we don't know about this today, but about 100 years ago in the South, it was terrible. In the South, uh, the diet uh, that we had was not a healthy diet. All the the minerals and nutrition that needed to be there weren't there. And this particularly affected women. And they would have this condition that was just extremely painful. It It is just a matter of having the right vitamins, but they didn't know that. One of the mothers of the church, young mother, was so consumed with this, that she could bear it no more. And I thought about her family. She's buried right out here. Leaving young children and a husband behind. But you know something? The church came and loved them through that. Young man died up in Virginia during the Civil War. 
church had a memorial service for him and his family. And they have been many more, on and on. But God's people came together, and in love they bore with one another. Today, are you bearing with one another? Do you care enough about the folks that are sitting by you in the pew today, or sitting around you to help them to grow in Christ and to deal with the problems that they're dealing with? There is not a one of you in here that is perfect. And I can tell you as a pastor, not knowing basically anything in terms of the connectivity with you other than getting your prayer list from your pastor. But I know as a pastor that some of you are here this morning and you are hurting. Some of you may be dealing with the opioid crisis in your life today and you, you're addicted. It may have started out as a prescription for pain. But today you are struggling. For some of you, it may be alcohol. For some of you, it may be a marriage that is falling apart. It may be infidelity that is tearing your heart and soul and your family apart. It can be any number of things. Real quick, how is it we can bear one another's burdens? First, to be transparent. We have to be open and honest with each other. Secondly, as a fellowship, you have to be able to receive that information in love, in confidentiality, and not with condemnation. That's why churches quit doing discipline more than anything else, was because it became a matter of gossip as opposed to a matter of concern. And some of the people that are sitting around you today that are not sharing their problems are not doing it because they don't want it to be a matter of gossip. And then to have the patience to lovingly to restore them and to let them know that you care about their best well-being and that you will, quote, bear with them their burden. When you as a fellowship do that, not only will God bless you and honor that, it will be transformative also for this fellowship because if the folks in this community know that that's the kind of love that folks have, like, uh, have here at Flat Creek, they will be busting down the doors to get in here. Because not only are folks hurting in here today, but in this nice affluent community that we live in, oh gracious day, they are hurting. And ultimately the only answer that will ever satisfy isn't just our love but it's the love of Christ that is flowing through us to each other, to a lost and dying world. And that, my friends, is our only hope. Father, I do pray that today that you would call us to yourself, that you would call us to be a people who love one another and to care enough about each other to be willing to bear each other's burdens. I pray, Father, for those here today that are struggling with the burdens of their life, I pray, Father, for maybe those marriages that are uh, about to fall apart. I pray for those who are dealing with uh, the uh, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be, or other addictions in their lives. I pray, Father, for those who are broken here today because they have a child or a grandchild that is not where they need to be today in their walk and their fellowship with you, and they have fallen in and stumbled into what the world says will make you feel better. I pray, Father, that today, that as we can uh, celebrate what you've done and we remember what God's people have done, that, Lord, we would not be content to stand on what you have done in the past, but, Lord, that we would claim your promises and that today we would stand up and bear one another's burdens for your glory and for our good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.